this work. Yeah, all right, so this is macular edema. I'm going to go through this kind of quick, but there's a couple points hopefully you'll take home from it. The biggest one probably the non-leakage non on fluorescent macular edema because that's always on exams. So, so first for cystoid macular edema, edema is Greek for excess fluid. And so anytime there's an accumulation of fluid in the retina, it's considered edema. I think there has to be swelling. So the, I've heard people call Mac, I think in the ret, nowadays with OCT, unless the retina is thick, I wouldn't call it edema. For example, MACTEL. So if you have MACTEL where there's no retinal thickening, people call those interretinal voids, they don't call it edema. Um, and then it's a disruption of the normal broad retinal barrier. We, the the subretinal fluid lecture talks about this some. You get a leakage from the paraphobial capillaries and accumulation of fluid and primarily in the outer plexiform layer in Prindley's layer. Um, like, so I this like is to ref I like that first point. For like a year, I when someone said, "Oh, they've got edema," yeah. I thought, "Oh, they've got cyst." Right. For like a year, that's a, that was. That's yeah, a little before. thickening is okay, but I think without thickening, I think you're hard pressed to call it edema. Mm -hmm. So this is a retina. Does anybody want to point to the outer plexiform layer? Is it a laser pointer? The laser pointer, or just about where it is. That one, right? No, or am I off? Is it this one? Yeah. 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 Okay. So you've got the there outer plexiform layers there, and that's the um, all the synapses going up to the um, the inner. You got the inner nuclear. That's the bipolar. Oh, yeah, the bipolar in the horizontal cells. The uh, so you've got the outer plexiform, and then the other thing you have in the center of the phobia is a Henle fiber layer, and they're right up against each other. You can't really see the difference on OCT scanning. But you can, you, sometimes if you angle the eye a certain way or if there's a retinal detachment, you pick up Henle fiber layer. That's the photo, that's the, the axons of all the cones and stuff coming off the center of the retina. And then the last one's the outer nuclear. So your outer nuclear's got your photoreceptors and then all the axons off the outer nuclear layer come through the Henle layer and the outer plexiform and, and, and hit the, the uh, horizontal and bipolar cells. And then those, process the retina go up to the ganglion cells. And that's where you tend to get most of your macular edema. If you remember our, um, the retinal vasculature, which I don't have on this, but the retinal vessels straddle the, the um, inner nuclear layer. This area, once you get out here, you actually don't have much vascularity, which is, I think, one of the reasons you get the accumulation of fluid here and here, because there's not much um, circulation to take it away. But if you look at diabetic macular edema, it tends to be mostly out here where there's no retinal vessels, which is something might be controversial. So Henley's fiber layers, unmyelinated cone and rod photoreceptor axons terminating in the um, uh, pedicles of the um, 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 outer plexiform layer. And so no leakage on FA. If you're going to remember anything, and I have this again at the end of the lecture, the main ones are juvenile retinoschisis. Oh, last month. We showed the case of the retinoschisis in the older guy, and then I circulated to my partners, and there is a name for that. It's called stellate non-hereditary idiopathic phobial retinoschisis, or sniffer, and um, and so I, so that's another diagnosis. So that's there's a paper on that, <laughs> and we showed the case of the guy who was, it was 60 or 70 and had uh, retinoschisis, but it was not hereditary. Goldman Favre, which I glump kind of with retinoschisis, and then certain types of RP, but I don't think you have to remember that because as most RPs do leak. And then nicotinic acid, which you do have to remember. Phototoxicity, I don't think you need. And then antimicrotubule agents, which are some chemotherapies, have no leakage on FA. Doesn't latinopause, can it also cause leakage? Leakage, oh, not yet. These are all, those are all the no, le right, the no leakage the ones are the ones. Pulse. But well, yeah, we'll get to that. Okay. So my I, uh, macular edema, I believe in the book and also just in general, I think of it in four different categories. The first one's structural. And we want to take a hit at like where there's the retinal vessels are just abnormally, structurally abnormal, where you get retinal swelling, what diseases, where there's a... So, diabetes yeah, diabetes. diabetes, yeah, diabetes coats, retinal vein occlusion, <clears throat> and uh, some macroaneurysm. So those are all diseases where the retinal vessels are just abnormal and they leak. We used to think that, but it turns out this is probably more complicated because of the treatments. You would think if that was the case, if it was all structural, that the anti-VEGFs wouldn't work, but they do. So it turns out it's probably in the, or the steroids. It's probably more complicated, but, you know, histopathologically, it's, it's structural. 
Um, this is a 68-year-old patient who came in to see me with diabetic retinopathy. She's 2040. This is the one we showed a little while ago. She's got severe macular edema in both eyes. This is a, the false color. You can see just diffuse leakage. So you can see some microaneurysms there, but also you can see in the late fluorescence, it's just leaking all over the place. And then if you look at the OCT, both eyes have interretinal fluid and even some subretinal fluid. And she was the one where we treated with a flibercept in the right eye, this is two weeks after, because I saw on the first visit, I don't treat bilaterally. I'll treat bilaterally on subsequent visits. I have somebody coming back today, I think, where it's, I've, I've seen in this week two bilateral wet AMDs, and a lot of times you get bilateral macular, diabetic macular edemas. I'll treat later bilaterally, and some people think that that's bad, but I think it's okay. It just saves people a lot of trips. Um, but it was interesting because the right eye went totally dry in just two weeks on a flibercept, and then the left eye went, went pretty dry. And I think that's a contralateral eye effect, which was just interesting. <clears throat> so for the pathophysiology for macular edema in those structural ones, like I said, it's more complicated. The diabetes, I think it's structural because you do, you see loss of parasites. I mean, everybody's going to ask you that. It's loss of parasites in diabetics. But also you get the, the anti-VEGF's work, the... Um, anti-inflammatories works. There's Ozerdex and Alluvian. And then also, you have to ask if any of your diabetics are on Actos or Avandia, those can cause retinal swelling. And I've had a rare case where that's the case, where they're doing okay, they get on these anti-diabetic meds. And then retinal vein occlusions also respond to the anti-VEGFs and soda macroaneurysms. Uh, treatment for the uh, diabetic macular edema is everything we always talk about, the laser, steroids, anti-VEGFs. I think a paper just came out this month on um, observing diabetics with macular edema in good vision. It says it's okay to do it, which is nice because I've always done that. Um, it was one of the protocols from DRC on that. They have three groups, I think, observe and treat and something else. And the observation ones did fine um, with good vision. So then inflammatory. So what are your inflammatory ones? for uveitis. macular edema. So all the uveituses. I, uh, parasplenitis is the one you'll see most commonly. And then also the prostaglandin, which Whitney said, the prostaglandin analogs. And then also, I don't have it in here, but, but um, we'll do more on pseudophagic at the very end. But pseudophagic macular edema is probably inflammatory just because the anti-inflammatories treat it. So this is a 63-year-old patient. I had cataract surgery four years ago vitrectomy for floaters two years ago, and then a year ago, um, developed macular edema just now, and she was on a glaucoma drop for a year. And this is the OCT, which isn't very striking, but this, when the macular, when the fluid's in the back of the retina, it can really affect the vision. And then this is the fluorescine, with showing this dystoid edema. And so what are your treatment gonna be? And she was somebody on uh, Travo, I always call it Travo, Travo Prost, I try to use generics. And we stopped it, and then a month later she was dry. So it probably was, in this case, a prostaglandin analog. The prostaglandin analogs were developed because people, it was found that uveitis patients had low pressure, their, their intraocular pressure dropped. So what happened was they came up with this idea of trying to find something that didn't induce inflammation but did drop the pressure, and that's where the drugs came from. But they really do probably cause a little inflammation. Um, okay, so then tractional. This is not going to be long now. <laughs> there's, uh, so we've got structural, so there's four things we're going to cover. Structural for macular edema, inflammatory, tractional. I mean, knows what that is. So you get an, either macular pucker or vitreo macular traction syndrome can cause uh, retinal swelling, and that's the traction on the vessels just causes them to leak. You're probably not stretching the retina. Do I, have, I don't have a fluorescein to show this, but in, the, in the, the macular puckers, if you do a fluorescein, the retinal vessels do leak. So it's not that the retina is being stretched out physically, it's that it's causing, it's disturbing the vessels, the vessels leak and the retina swells. So macular pucker, but your macular traction. This was a good patient. This is like these pictures. 64-year-old patient saw me with a 20-30 pucker, and we left it alone. And this is what it looks like. And she had some swelling, so I'm showing it because of the cyst, but also just because it's an interesting case. The, the false color pictures are great for macular puckers. A lot, sometimes you don't see a macular. If you show someone a color picture or examine the patient, you won't always see a macular pucker. And if you get the multicolor picture, it just pops out at you. And then she came back with a central artery occlusion in the fellow eye, in the right eye, just to, three years after those first pictures, and she looked like this. In the macular pucker, it scrolled up. 
Is that cool? So she was, so the macular swelling went away and she self peeled. The, the non central macular pucker, sometimes if they tighten up enough, they'll self peel. I think it's about a 5% rate. So she did okay. And um, so that's macular edema from traction. It's probably stretched, some stretching of the retina, but mostly damage to the vessels. And then you have to look at them for other problems. So do they have diabetes? Are they pseudophagic? Is there a vascular occlusion? What I if I had all the pictures, actually I was going to show a case because I did a case on Wednesday, of, last Wednesday of a patient who I did this. They had a macular pucker and macular edema. I gave him a posterior subtina and Kenalog shot, waited a month, it didn't get better. And then I took the pucker off and it just dried right out. But then I remembered lately for all of my patients with any macular swelling, I've just been injecting Kenalog at the time of the vitrectomy. So it's like a belt and suspenders thing. So I'm not sure it wasn't some of the Kenalog and some of the pucker peel. And then the last one we're going to cover for just general is dystrophic for macular edema. And we saw a case of that today, retinitis pigmentosa, X-linked retinoschisis. This is a 46-year-old patient. Five siblings have diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. Um, she noticed a substantial division, vision decline in both eyes over the last month or two. And she's 20, 40, 20, 50. This, oh, I, you know, I never brought this case in. This was a little bit funny retina because she has these white spots. So she was a lady who had no pigment in white spots, but I don't think it was albi punctata or punctata albescence. I think it was just retinitis pigmentosa with white spots. And um, if you look at her autofluorescence, you can see the symmetric loss of uh, uh, outer retina around the side, which comes up bright like we talked about, with some of these dark streaks around the vessels. And then the fluorescein shows macular edema. So this is the right eye. She's got a little bit of swelling there and a little bit of staining around the optic nerve. And I this is her OCT before and after treatment. Oh, this is an eight-year-old child. Oh, this is because we talked about this before. This is an eight-year-old kid I have with, with uh, excellent retinoschisis. That's the macula, and I have a video, I think, which should play. Yeah, look at that. I like that image. You can get this image on a Heidelberg. It's just kind of pretty. You know, I, we usually don't look at it just because it's, it's unnecessary, but it is pretty to look at the retina that way. So with excellent retinoschisis, it's the RS1 gene. It's not uncommon, one in 15,000. The, the question you'll get on the boards is the histopathology of X-linked retinoschisis is they split at the nerve fiber layer. But if you look at them, the foveal schesis is actually not at the nerve fiber layer, it's deeper. Which I didn't actually, I hadn't thought that over until this case. So this is a scan through the periphery of this person's eye and you can see the nerve fiber layer schesising out. But then when you look at the macula, the schesis is um, in the middle of the retina. So what is that? That's the inter internuclear layer, I think. Outer nuclear. Outer nuclear. Outer nuclear. Yeah. Okay. So you got your. Yeah. I'll drink some coffee and we'll come to me. So those are the four things. So you've got structural, inflammatory, tractional, and dystrophic. So if you have macular edema, you can think about those things. And then the subsets. And then the last one, just to talk about pseudophagic. Pseudophagic macular edema is probably mostly inflammatory. It might be a little bit tractional. Because if there's not a PVD, you might have these forces tr uh, transmitting through. And then this is a typical patient with macular edema. They had cataract surgery. They saw me in April, but usually people don't send them to me right away. So this person had cataract surgery. The vision got better. Excuse me. But then they stopped, then they stopped their medicines. It got worse. And then was back on and off the drops three times. And the vision just kept getting worse. The vision is 20 60. There's asteroid hylosis, but if you look really hard, the right eye has macular edema. You can see on the autofluorescence the absence of pigment in the center and the sort of petaloid uh, distrib distribution you get without even doing any fluorescein. The left eye was normal, and then the fluorescein shows leakage, and so um, and then the OCT shows a bunch of fluid. So that's sort of a typical pseudophagic macular edema patient. You will get some people who are recalcitrant, and you just keep them on drops longer. So, and I have some people, I have a guy, I have some people on drops for a year. You know, what you do is you taper them down slowly, down to one, and then you sort, I usually keep them on two drops, a steroid and non steroidal and then I ask them which one's their favorite, and then they continue that. Usually try to continue the non steroidal for maybe three to six months. This one, you, I, I, if that's severe, I usually give them a posterior centeno catalog injection. Um, once macular edema has recurred, the recurrence rate subsequently becomes higher. And I believe if it's occurred once, it, the recurrence rate second time is 50%. If it occurs twice, the recurrence rate is 80%. But you have to make sure you've given them a fair trial. So there's a difference. If you look at uveitis in all this, there's a, there's a difference between recurrent 
disease versus undertreated disease. So if you stop and it comes right back, it's not really recurrent. Hey. You say the incidence of CME, suffix CME is higher in patients without a PVD? Without, oh no, it might be. I'm not sure. But there's, is that, does anybody know that? But there, there's, a, there's something with the traction. And some people think pseudophagic macroedema is a little bit of traction, but you wouldn't expect there was a tractional component in some of the PVD. So, so you'd expect that's just inflammatory. But this is, and then this is just all stuff you need to know about pseudophagic CME, which you probably know. So it tends to come on three months after surgery, peak incidence is four to six weeks. 20, it's seen in 25% of non-diabetic patients in uncomplicated cataract surgery. It's seen in 50% of diabetic patients with mild to moderate uh, NPDR and no CME preoperatively. Usually there's no visual reduction, but in zero to 6% of non-diabetic subjects, there's visual complaints. Um, and topical NSAIDs are the only thing that have actually been proven to help. There's actually no proof for topical corticosteroids, and it seems like the NSAIDs are probably a little bit better. So usually you want to use a combination of steroids and NSAIDs to reduce the odds of developing um, CME. A number of my patients are coming in now from the cataract surgeons with these compounded drops, which are kind of cool, where they get them for like 60 or 80 bucks, the pharmacy gives them a drop that's got the antibiotic, the steroid, and the non steroid on it. I haven't quite done that yet. This was a review, of, and, and it shows that NSAIDs reduce the odds of developing CME as compared to topical steroids and non-diabetics and mixed populations and a combination of, uh, combination of NSAID and steroids help reduce the incidence compared to a single drug. There's no difference between topical combinations and topical com NSAIDs, so you can use just NSAIDs and non-diabetics. And none of, there's, there, a lot of stuff's not known, so there's not really any good studies on intravitreal. This was one of these review of reviews. And so topical NSAIDs, I don't know what you guys use, because there is a choice. You can use diclofenac, ketorolac, um, bromfenac, and nep Buzacular. Buzacular. A lot of VA attendings actually don't prescribe the NSAID anymore. Oh, they just go steroids? Yeah, that's right. Which I, diabetic. yeah, but according diabetic. to all the evidence, it's more that you should use the NSAIDs, yeah. which is weird. That's what I didn't expect to find that. That's why I put it in the lecture. All the, all the scientific <laughs> evidence lines up for the NSAIDs. And I can tell you, the, the NSAIDs, the AccuVail is very comfortable, but it's super expensive. Some of these newer NSAIDs. Yeah, they're going to do more prone Oh, at the time of surgery? Yeah. And then, so you should know for NSAIDs, there, is, there are some issues. So I just, this, some, one of my staff came back to me and said it was flagged when I prescribed Ketorolac because she was on Prodaxa. So I don't, so there is a worry a little bit about, where you can get surface irritation and you also can get corneal problems if your surface is abnormal. So be careful about using. And then they said, because of the mild anesthetic effects, there are warnings about people who have corneal disease. And then also there's a warning on the label about systemic anticoagulation. Um, for topical insets. I don't know that that's such an issue, but you can. And then also, I don't know if you ask about asthma, but for asthma, for your topical beta blockers and NSAIDs, you should ask about that. So in summary, there's the four things you should remember, structural, inflammatory, tractional, and dystrophic for diabetes, anytime you see edema. And then, um, I that's in there. And then for no leakage, I would just remember these four, and really just the top three. The juvenile retinoschisis is the one I think you're gonna see. Golden Favre, you might see, and then nicotinic acid. Those are the I see nicotinic acid and juvenile retinoschisis all the time. The chemotherapy agents, you could put that in, but you probably have to say the once, and it's hard to keep track of all the drugs nowadays. So I listed those there, but to say the person's on Taxol and for you to know that it's a non-leakage fluorescein seems a little harsh. Um, and that's not true. 